so Jen, are you excited for what you know is coming? I am going to speak on behalf of the women of Toronto. I'm sure that they will appreciate that mightily. Yeah, no, it's about time I stand up and do this. Now, look, so you and I were talking just, we always have a quick catch up chat before we click record on these videos. The big story this week is CTV canning Lisa LaFlamme. Uh, yeah. And I, and honestly, it's, it's so dominated our circles and it's so dominated media sphere. It's almost like there's nothing else to talk about. I think that's part of it. I think, I yeah. think it's, it's a late August story. Uh, yeah, true, 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 true. But you know, what's interesting before I get into the meat of what I was going to say, we had some uh, reader feedback when we published a column by Kevin Newman. I do read all the emails that come in. Some of them are crazy and I just kind of delete them. But like, I do read all the emails that come in. And a couple of them were saying, guys, this is too inside baseball. Like I didn't sign up to the line to hear about media gossip. Well, first of all, that's weird because we've been doing lots yeah, of We've been literally doing time. media gossip from the beginning, just so that we're clear. Like we have an ample sources yeah. of media gossip. The other thing is that Kevin Newman's column for us this week was gangbusters. Yeah. The it went gangbusters. The, the 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 audience and readership metrics on this was bonkers. So like literally he knocked off, I think, one of my columns for one of our most read pieces of all time. And I'm kind of resentful about it. Like I've got to actually up my game. Yeah. I hadn't I, I hadn't looked it. at it from that perspective, but in terms of stuff we've run this summer, and look, summer's always slow. But this was a big readership drop. Right. For any for any time of year it was. Yeah. Yep. So like this is what's sort of interested. interesting is that you know, print people tend to poo-poo TV and we're tend to tend to be the first to be like, eh, who really gives a shit of who's the news anchor? You know, like honestly. But you know, obviously there's interest in this story. There just there just is. So and I think there's a lot of really interesting reasons why there's so much interest in this story. Yeah. Um but like, like, like we us print people tend to be a little bit dismissive of TV news because bluntly it's such a declining media. It, it's such a holdover of, of era past. And, and I think all of us have kind of like, we don't watch the nightly news anymore. That's something that frankly, the gray hairs do, but we often forget that the gray hairs still make up a significant portion of the country. And if Lisa LaFam is pulling in like a million watchers a night. That's that's a huge number. Like that, that's a big number by any by any metric. Well, this is kind of where it all ties back into me speaking on behalf of the women of Toronto, which is obviously me being tongue in cheek. Don't roast me for this. Um, so I told you this a few days ago. I think, like, I'm going to tell you my meta theory on what this story is in a couple of minutes, but I want to tell you the particular context that you probably don't know about unless you are really plugged in specifically with media in Toronto. Mm -hmm. There has been a series of stories in the last couple of years of uh, women who are prominent in Toronto media being very suddenly put out to pasture, uh, as one of them described it to me. And this is her words, not mine. Like, the, moments my, the moment my boobs sagged, I was out of a job. It's mm -hmm. like you have this period of peak physical beauty in your 20s and your 30s, and then when you get getting into your 40s, if especially if you're in a TV role, you are out the door. Mm -hmm. And there's been a series of these in, in kind of recent years that are getting more and more attention, where women who either have new careers in media or, or who have left media entirely have been talking about what it was to be sort of at their professional peak but they had a couple of wrinkles and they didn't fit into the, the clothes they fit into 20 years ago. And they are just blown out the door. Yeah. Meanwhile, the guy ages gracefully in place in front of a million nightly viewers. Right. Yeah. And I think part of what gave the Lisa LaFlamme story such currency in the Toronto media in particular, to an extent that maybe people wouldn't understand outside of Toronto was that this is just the latest and an example of that, right? Like there's all, like, you know, like the media loves patterns. Mm -hmm. So it, like if this was happening in isolation, I don't know if it gets the currency of it that it did without the recent stories being told by other kind of Toronto area female media personalities. Like uh, to give you a sense of just how prevalent this is, when we were talking on the phone earlier this week, I said, you know, when I was in journalism school in my 20s, uh, we had to choose between three streams. I think it was like broadcast, radio, or print. You you chose in your in your second or third year, you chose which stream you wanted to focus on, and then your classes were were focused on that. So if you wanted into, wanted to get wanted to get into broadcast, you did more technical type training, camera work, on air work, that kind of thing. 
Um, and if you wanted to go into print, you, you kind of specialized a little bit. You did more magazine writing and feature writing to classes to, of that nature. And, you know, even in my early 20s, I was like, well, I'm going to go into print. <laughs> Why? Well, two reasons. One, because I know from print, if you develop sort of a career in print, you can branch out from that. If you can write, you know, and write coherently and cogently, uh, you can kind of do anything. And secondly, I was like, yeah, I'm a pretty 20 year old, but like, I'm not gonna be a pretty 20 year old forever. And I'd like to have a long career. Mm. So I'm going to write, I'm going to be able to write much longer than I'm going to be pretty. Um, and to me, this was just a really, really straightforward, like, I'm not saying that that was fair or justifiable or good or, or, but that was just such the obvious way of the world as it, as I saw it at, in my twenties, that that was just absolutely a factor in my decision-making. I think the only thing that's different between now and then is that women in particular are talking about it more, which is good, yes, by the way. Which is good. And like, and by the way, that shouldn't be the norm. It just, it yeah. just, you know, I was, I was working with the world as I saw it, not as the world as I wanted it to be. It's a pattern you and I both have. I've, I've been reluctant to say this this week because uh, I, I read the room um, and I, I decided to withhold my brilliance until now. First of all, hey, my, I'm on my own turf here. Uh, secondly, I gave it a couple of days to cool off, but notwithstanding the fact that I think Lisa LaFlamme's story fit a narrative that's already rightly getting attention, particularly in the Toronto media circle of how women have their careers abruptly ended in ways that men don't. Mm -hmm. I think the other angle, and I've told you this, and you and I talked about this a little bit, I think people are drawing the wrong conclusion from this story. So I think a lot of the, the narrative, Jen, tell me if you think I'm wrong here, is that Lisa Flam was fired by CTV because of sexism, ageism, and misogyny. I think that that is the, that is the, the dominant sort of narrative Yes, but we're going to we're going to poke at that a little bit. But like yes. Okay. I agree that ageism, sexism and misogyny are problems in the media and undoubtedly contributed to the end of Lisa Laflamme's career. But I don't think that's the story. And this is where I think people will get pissy with me because you talk about this and it's like I'm denying or I'm minimizing. No, I'm not doing any of these things. But I think you have to step back a little bit and go Ignore the details of CTV, ignore the details of Lisa LaFlamme, look at the industry as a whole. This is what I think the takeaway is. TV news is dying. And I think you can look at what happened to Lisa LaFlamme and go, this is yet another example of a powerful man in a company silencing an accomplished woman, which it probably is. But I also think you're missing the big picture if that's what you look at here. Because Bell, which disclosure, I'm a freelancer for, has been aggressively downsizing its broadcast operations in recent years. Um, you and I have written in a previous dispatch, two entire radio newsrooms in the two largest cities in this country, uh, CFRB 1010 in Toronto, CJAD 800 in Montreal. They had full radio newsrooms with their own editors, their own directors, their own reporters. Both of those have been eliminated in recent years. Bell has also cut at its local CTV uh, news affiliates, it's been cutting staff. It cut production staff, which had been mostly centralized in Toronto. All of this stuff is a matter of record, right? Because some of these positions are unionized. And when these cuts happen, it's announced. Uh, Global News, which is the primary private sector competitor to Bell, a couple of years ago, it announced that it was eliminating local newscasts in favor of what they called multi-market newscasts to be produced and anchored in Toronto. So it would be sort of like a, a, the bones of a national newscast with local stories slotted in by local reporters, but all the anchoring in the production would be done centrally in Toronto. You can look at Lisa Laflamme in isolation, or you can even look at her as part of the latest in a series of women to come to abrupt career ends. But I actually think you need to look at it from the perspective of global wiping out local newscasts, C uh, Bell wiping out two big radio newsrooms and condensing its TV news production here. Yeah, this they're incrementally is... they're incrementally canning news. Yeah, yeah, they're they're incrementally shutting down their news divisions, and, and maybe they're... they will never shut it down ent entirely. It'll follow but... the print trajectory. They'll just get yeah. smaller and more pathetic. Smaller and more pathetic until it's basically a, a shell of its former shell. Yeah, and, I... and 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 in that environment, can you afford a six figure anchor figure? Well, it, it's probably not yeah. justifiable. Well, I mean, six figure, but maybe not with Lisa LaFam six figure. Or are you are you going to spend half to a quarter of her salary and 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 put someone younger in there for a couple of years? I think you know I, I've been talking in the last couple of days with my Toronto media broadcast colleagues, right? Because that's mm -hmm. like I, I'm I'm half a print guy, I'm half a broadcast guy. I got a foot in each world, 
and I've been kind of in my broadcasting group chats talking about this and people keep saying, I don't think it's about the money. It has to be about the sexism or it has to be about the relationship because they still like, they still have to pay out LaFlamme's contract. Right. So technically they're not saving any money. Okay. But I think that's wrong. Okay. Because I think, La, because I think LaFlamme is not entirely an issue of money. I think if you're going to crush your broadcast operations, you got to wipe out the powerful old guard. Yep. You got to, you got to take her against the wall to encourage the, to discourage yeah. the Otras. And it also allows the new hatchet man to stake a certain, it, it, it's also about power. Um, but so also, here- yeah, you get rid of the person who would have a big public profile, a lot of credibility, a lot of yep. audience sympathy. You yep. put in a new guy, uh, Omar, Omar Ashanita, who's been given the job in La Flamme's place. I don't know the guy, but apparently a complete gentleman, a complete professional, but the way he's coming into this job, he's already kneecapped. Yep. Like he can't resist what the company might wish to do. And I, lest the, the audience think, Jen, that this is all just idle speculation on my part. Mm-hmm. I've spent the last couple of days pulling as many numbers as I can to back this up. And let me tell you what I found. I can't tell you what CTV National News is pulling in in terms of revenue specifically. I don't know. I also don't know what their specific budget is. It's not public knowledge. But what I can tell you is two things. First of all, CTV National News is this country's largest evening television newscast, but its audience over the last five or six years is stable or shrinking. Mm -hmm. I can also tell you that- And will continue to die. TV ad revenue is, even on 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 an ad per thousand viewer basis, declining across North America. I don't know how dramatically it's declining. And again, I don't know the specifics of Bell CTV, but the overall industry trend is that the value of television advertising for a 30 second spot to X number of thousands of viewers is down. Third, it's what you were just hinting at there. The audience is getting old. Like this is not a young demographic. The television audience- and The kinds of kinds of advertising that, that, that they're doing is therefore less valuable because yeah. a lot of audience advertising is valued by demographic because someone who's on a fixed income is less valuable as a viewer than someone who's like in their 30s who uh, has growing income. Look, this is me being an experienced broadcast professional. For advertising purposes, the most desirable demographic are adults from age 25 to 54. Yep. The median television viewing age, I don't have stats to back this up, but I was asking a buddy of mine who is a, a TV executive just a few weeks ago, and he w- was lamenting, but even before La Flamme got sacked, he was lamenting the fact that the TV audience in North America is aging out. Yep. Like, like my kids do not watch anything on television. Nope, they watch TV mind. shows, but they watch it streaming. Yeah. Right. Or, or YouTube. Yeah. And so- my kids would not know how to be like, oh, it's three o'clock and on channel seven, it's my favorite show. Totally foreign to them. So you've got a median TV viewership age in this country that is already way older than the baseline population. The news viewing audience has to be even older than that. Yep. So I think I'm not denying sexism, misogyny, power dynamics, none of that stuff. But I think the big story here is that radio, radio news in this country is almost dead. TV news is dying. Print yeah. is dying. And that's what you should be taking away. So here's, here's where I line. get into the, here's where I get into the, uh, into the nitpicks of, of the Lisa LaFlam story, because there's a lot of the Lisa LaFlam story that doesn't, how shall I say this? Uh, I, I'm always going to be a little bit heretical on these sorts of stories. And when I see a, 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 an Iron Clan media narrative coalesce around a particular angle, I'm you, always skeptical of it. You go off axis. Yeah, I know. I kind of go off axis. So here's here's what I would say is that um, Brian Lilly and a few others have published pieces mm-hmm. that I think are actually very good and, and sort of challenge the dominant narrative a little bit. Um, the first thing I will point out here is that everybody involved in this story is an operator. Sure. Whether you're talking about CTV and their senior execs or La Flamme and her people, these people know how to craft narratives. They know who to leak to. They know how to play this game. All right. So here's a couple of things that I will observe. I mean, Lisa La Flamme is actually married to Michael Cook, who's a former editor in chief of the Toronto Star, which means like you, you know, you, you know which paper is going to be getting the Lisa La Flamme angle. Like, like this is like these people know how to operate within this system and they know how to try and present their best narrative face forward. So here's a thing that I will observe about the Lisa LaFam thing. According to CTV, she was given an opportunity to do an on-air goodbye, yeah. provided she 
parrot some degree of the company line. She declined that. And instead she decides to do a, you know, a video from the cottage order of Canada of, of Canada flag pin in view. And she releases that at exactly the same time they're announcing Omar, her replacement, Omar, thereby totally poisoning the well for Omar. Yeah. Poisoning the well for her, for her, for her successor, and also doing a giant fu to CTV on the way out. That video was not off the cuff. That was, as I would expect from a professional journalist and, and broadcaster, well crafted and well rehearsed. And that the timing a, of it was not a coincidence. Now no, that was a precision missile strike. Correct. They, they, she so, hit it exactly yeah, where this, and when this, she wanted. You know, correct. And I would just draw people's attention to that fact. Secondly, I would draw people's attention to the fact that there was nothing um, uh, accidental about any of that. So that was a choice. So then I have to start asking some questions of like, okay, so right after that goes out, a source uh, leaks information to Canada land about how this was all basically sexism and ageism. Okay. Again, I might possibly, yeah, that's a possible question, but then I'm looking at the actual examples and that is well lisa was fighting for more resources to ukraine and apparently she was fighting against having her second in command be um shunted off to another newscast i'm going like fighting over resources to a foreign war is like everyday stuff in a newsroom that's not you, you're not firing someone over that that's not a power struggle that that's just that's a day ending and why and maybe you're 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 really pushing against having your little team at CTV broken up, and that was a big point of contention. Okay, interesting, but again, not necessarily proof of misogyny or or sexism. Then there's comes out this story, for example, in in um, I think Brian Lilly first broke this that there was actually some very serious contentious issues about her involvement with the Patrick Brown case and to what extent she cost the company uh serious legal fees because of the patrick brown stuff okay i think that's probably a factor that gets overlooked in the more credulous reporting um then you get into the story like uh the, the globe and mail just broke the fact that apparently melling who's who's being cast as the villain in all of this melling's the uh, news director who was yeah. not really the guy who made the, the yeah the, the news director yeah. Yeah, apparently uh, Melling basically is like started questioning who allowed Lisa Laflamme to go gray, and of course that then furthers uh, the the misogyny, the, uh, the misogyny narrative. So like, yeah. uh, I'm looking at all this and I'm like, is it beyond the realm of possibility to, to me that Melling was a total uh, prick who was out to 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 who who a was trying to reduce costs in the newsroom got into a power struggle with one of the old guard and one of the senior people and decided to take that power struggle to its ultimate end. Yeah, that seems like entirely plausible to me. Is it totally plausible to me that this was all because Melling was Melling was actually a sexist ageist? That's a little too simple. I, I don't necessarily think that that adds up. And I think when you start to consider the fact that, you know, Lisa LaFlamme gets booted for a dude who probably cost the company half as much. Mm, you know, you start to do the math on that and you're like, eh, I don't know. And then comes the third parts of all of this where I start to question this narrative. And I'm like, yeah, but but Lloyd Robertson got to like basically be on air until he was falling over on the table half dead. I'm like, yes. And who in 2022 expects that they are going to have a newsreader role into their 70s? Who like hands up here if you honestly think any newsreader is lasting that long post 2022? Like Omar is not going to be around 10 years or longer. Bluntly, he's not. The newscast itself probably isn't going to be around 10 years or longer. Like. I, that's not this isn't man nobody's re re recreating mansbridge or barbara walters or walter cronkite Kreit in the current tv news environment that is not that's not going to happen and that's not something any newsreader male or female should be expecting so like i'm not discounting the the sexism ageism thing as being a factor in all of this but i think that once you start to peel across the onion and challenge some of that fact it, it the the picture starts to look a little bit more complicated than that I, look, I agree. Um, the, the the only comment I would add on Laflamme like hitting CTV with that perfectly aimed shot was, well, actually, I had two comments. First of all, I don't actually blame her for doing that. Like, okay, so she, she goes out and she flips some bir the bird and she uh, totally causes some chaos for them. I agree with you. A bunch of well timed leaks coming out. Uh, making the company look bad okay yeah you know what she, she takes some shots on the way out that's fine i tend to think they're probably accurate enough 
but I don't, I don't deny that your the fact that you're right. She's an operator. The other thing that jumps out at me though, and this is a meta problem. A lot of me media companies in this country have is that the moment any media company in this country has a scandal, they forget everything they know is a media company. Yep. 100%. Um, like when we are covering the scandal in like any institution, they panic every time. Yeah. The, and every time. And they and they forget that the people who work for competing outlets are not morons. Yeah. So like and I I have seen these things from the outside. I have been involved in them on the inside in senior enough roles. There is an instinctive ass covering. Deny it until it goes away. People will stop caring tomorrow. Media companies are probably the worst at managing the media when it's their dirty laundry. Being Which is aired. very funny. It, it, well, you know, but that said, I, you know, there is something to be said for just letting this one ride out because what, what are they going to say or do now? Uh, you know what? I told a friend of mine today um, who is herself a CTV veteran. Uh, and still there. In fact, I think she's pretty up in arms over this and she goes, the company is going to regret this. I'm like, well, the company probably already regrets it. Like this, yeah, this, like, this was nobody, not the week they were planning on. Well, I know that nobody disputes the way that she was fired was, was bad. bad. That was, yeah. that was badly done. It was badly handled. No one's, no one's a dispute of that, but the 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 real brass tax is going to start to come down in the fall when people actually see whether or not revenues or ratings drop. Yep. No, that's basically exactly what I told my friend. I said there are two possibilities here. A, that CDV Bell, Bell firing Lisa Laflamme is a catastrophic move for the company that is going to materially damage the company and end a bunch of careers there. B, it is a two week story in the August doldrums and Labor Day comes, all the kiddies go back to school, Russia invades another, like, you know what I mean? Like, we're gonna, so I don't know. People um, give Omar I, a shot, Omar's great, like, you know, like, and the audience continues to get old and die. Yep. And the, the ratings are, they don't spike, but they continue their plateau and their slow decline under Omar. Yeah. Like, I, again, I've been looking at CTV national news and global national ratings for going back as many years as I can find them. They're not in free fall, but they're not like they're plateaued at best. So I, I honestly think that the this, trend the, line is slowly down. The, the, the judgment for this decision is is going to be um, decided by how the ratings uh, wash out in sort of September, October. And if the ratings go into free fall post La Flamme, then, you know, Melling's toast that that will happen melling will just be out and if they don't then everybody will quietly will be like mm, i guess the anchors didn't matter all that much and probably what you will see is you'll see a wave of sort of firing of overpriced anchors right across the the board because people will be like eh. well we've talked about that a little bit off the air it's worth mentioning i actually pulled some numbers on this too uh not not numbers but a timeline so cbc the national the uh, national news broadcast that is, in fact, so poorly rated, it doesn't even crack the top 30 in the numerous uh, weekly mm -hmm. numbers. Peter Mansbridge, the icon, right? Like the guy mm -hmm. does the anchor job for, for decades and decades. Boom, he's gone, replaced in a weird way by like a rotating cast. But you can read into that because there were four rotating anchors. Two of them were women. Two of them were men. Both of the men were men of color. Mm -hmm. So CBC sent like a brand signal there. Now we jump over to Global. Kevin Newman, our buddy, he's replaced from his job as the national anchor by Donna Friesen, a woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, I think Global, Global has already signaled Farah Nasser, who, whom I know and like very much in Toronto. I think they're signaling that she is the successor anchor. She's already doing the fill-in broadcast. She's doing the evening broadcasts. So we Which, go by the way, is how you do a transition. That's pro that's exactly. appropriately how you do a transition. How they should have done the transition here. So, so global. If I'm I'm speculating here, I don't know if Farah has it for sure, but it goes from Kevin White dude to Donna White woman to Farah Brown woman. So I think we're seeing the flow through of of the global brand there. CTV, Lloyd Robertson, decades in the job, white dude, boom, he's gone. White woman takes over. Historic. It's a it's a female broadcaster taking over a national broadcast. Boom, she's gone. But CTV has Omar, who is a Muslim man. So I think we're seeing how all the companies are trying to do this here. And call me cynical. I'm not like all of these journalists are great. I got nothing yeah. against any of these people. No, you have to be great to be at that level. Like yeah. you can't be bad at that 
to, at, at, at journalism or any of this and be at that level. It's just too competitive. But what the companies are doing is when they're making business related decisions, they're also taking it as an opportunity to do something good for the brand. So <laughs> uh, we got to get rid of Lloyd. People are going to be mad. Give it to a woman. Make it a good news story. Same with Kevin at Global. Donna takes over. Now, Donna, I mean, I don't I have no idea. How, I, I don't talk to the Global guys much anymore, which is something of an understatement. But I, I worked there a few years ago, as you know. Um, Farah is great. She would do a completely credible job. I don't know if or when she'll get it for sure. I don't know how long Donna wants to stay. I, I don't know any of these things. But I know if Global chooses to suddenly sack her and there is a kind of outcry like this and Farah gets the nod... That is a very deliberate corporate strategy in the same way that choosing Omar is because you go, what do you mean? We're, we're giving a, a, uh, the first uh, Muslim woman, uh, it would be in Farah's yeah. case, the big promotion in, in Canada here. These yeah. are all corporate strategies. They're really transparent ones. And this is yeah. why, like I said before, media companies cannot handle being on the receiving end of this. Um, you and I could run down a list here and tick off. We won't because I think the listeners are probably hoping yeah. to move on. Media companies cannot handle scrutiny. And it's funny, we talk, uh, you know, the Hockey uh, hockey Canada scandal that's been going around about uh, yep. the sexual abuse allegations. There's been a lot of talk in, in, in recent years about, you know, Me Too, um, institutional problems in, in big companies. Is there a simpler explanation for all this? Maybe we as human beings have an instinctive ass covering reflex here. And the problem is not that our institutions are corrupting us. It's that they're built in our image, right? And even media companies, we shine a light on truth. All these high, high, highfalutin noble ideals. The moment or we have some workplace scandal, all of a sudden we forget everything we ever known. And it's like, bury the story, cover it up. So I, I I have I have a better uh, general axiom that I follow when I when I think about these things, and that is institutions wind up uh, promoting or embodying the very issues that they were created to fight. You see this a lot. Now it's not all the time, but in nonprofits you see this all the time. So say you have a nonprofit that's devoted to fighting domestic domestic abuse for against women. Nine times out of ten, they will promote and put in put into the CEO posi position an abusive male, like not necessarily a physically abusive male, but like someone who like berates everyone in order to get yeah. things done. The loud um, bully. It, like I was uh, on the board of a nonprofit that was like devoted to helping a uh, corporation or nonprofits define themselves and deal with their governance issues, and its governance issues was an absolute disaster, and it couldn't define itself out of a out of a square peg. Like like it, like literally hilarious. Every anti poverty organization and every anti gets in a spending scandal about exactly gets into a spending scandal exactly. Yeah. Like this literally happens again and again. It's one of the most hilarious little quirks of human nature that they all like everybody suffers from this weird hypocritical blind spot and it seems to be that media organizations that exist to like expose everybody else fall into this trap too they don't yep. like to be exposed <laughs> like just don't look at us don't look at us we'd expose other people like i have a very just, specific it's a memory weird thing no i have a very specific memory of trying to warn some people i worked with who were more senior to me if this was another outlet and we were looking out, would we accept the press release we're about to put out? Or yeah. would it just send up all kinds of red flags? Yeah. It is what it is, man. But anyway, let's move on. Um, You know what? Honestly, uh, Lisa LaFlamme kind of ate, ate the, the video podcast today. But to be honest with you, there actually wasn't that much else. I think we, we've got two other dispatches kind of kind of in the in the works. So like, I think that we, we break Lisa LaFlamme up into three parts. One is kind of an introductory part. You do the actual uh, business analysis okay. and then I'll do like the OK, but let's 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 start to peel away the actual official narrative here and find out if there's more to the story than than not. And let's sort of peel back what we actually know. I think that that actually be a good to do. Um, I want you want to talk a little bit about the about the RCMP hearings. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, a very little bit. Um, so we we've, we've been covering in recent dispatches that uh, Bill Blair, who at the time of the Nova Scotia massacre was the public safety minister, he's the minister of emergency preparedness now, but he's being called back to testify about what he was doing when he was emergency preparedness minister. 
um when when the in early 2020 when when the massacre happened and for the listeners who may have totally taken the summer off the allegations here are on top of a botched rcmp response to the actual attacks in nova scotia there have been accusations by members of the local rcmp command that there was pressure coming from national rcmp headquarters specifically from brenda lucky the national commissioner to release certain details of the investigation regarding guns so that the liberals could then take that information and use it as sort of a, a, to help them with a gun control political announcement. The problem with that, whatever your views on gun control are, you cannot be co-opting law enforcement investigations for partisan political purposes. Mm-hmm. And if, if Commissioner Lucky, as she's been accused of, and she denies this, but if she was indeed pressuring local officers to suit the political agenda of the liberals that's a fundamental breakdown of the dividing line between you know political politics and police independence it's a total no-go you can't do that and uh blair has in very careful language denied any wrongdoing commissioner lucky in absurdly careful language has denied any wrongdoing. We wrote in one of our recent dispatches, the denials are so carefully written, they read to us more as confessions. Yep. Like when when you have to come out with a really precise statement, it makes me like, well, like we were talking about a few minutes ago, right? Like you don't know how to handle the media. So Blair and Lucky had already testified. We've covered that in previous dispatches. It won't be a huge written blurb, but the RCMP local, officials including the commander and also a civilian staffer a communications advisor who had been very much um uh, tied in with all these allegations she has and he have now testified and basically i i watched some of it and then i read the transcripts after they are 100 calling bullshit on commissioner lucky's denials they're not they're not putting anything new out there like they're not making new allegations but they're sitting before parliament and they're going the commissioner told us that we had to get these details out because there was a gun control announcement that was coming and that she was feeling pressure from above. She can explain that however she wants. She can put whatever spin on that she wishes. But this is what we were in the conversation being told. And and uh, one of them, uh, uh, Superintendent um, oh, Darren Campbell, I think his name was, I'll have to, I'll have to check that. He basically said after the first hour, like I walked out of the meeting and discuss. And one of the MPs said to him, like, and how much of the meeting until that point had been about get the details of the guns out so they can be used. And he's like, all of it. That was the meeting. Right. So like Commissioner Lucky has been sort of saying, hey, this was always ill chosen language on my part and part of a tense meeting. Commissioner Lucky's like, this was the meeting. Like, this is what we were being pushed to do this because there were expectations from above at the political level that we were going to get this information out so it could be used. It doesn't advance the story in any way. There's no, no, no new news here to break, but it, it's just it. After all the spin and, and evasive maneuvers we've seen, they just come out and just repeat exactly what the allegations are. I don't know. It's August. I don't know how much people are paying attention, but I think people should be paying attention to this one. So I'll, I'll whip up something on that. Yeah, do we also want to do something about the the crazy wave of um you know actually no we may have something something written coming on that about uh, the harassment that women journalists are getting. We've kind of written about this before, but you know what? We actually have a piece coming about that. So well, what mind. we've written about before is that we just need the police to treat crimes like crimes. Yeah, and the fact that they're not is getting interesting. But anyway, um Jason Kenny called uh the Sovereignty Act nuts because it's uh Alberta the show. Uh I just sort of want to write a little comment on that and that everything he said is 100% correct, but as per Jason Kenny's sort of Greek chorus like curse, it he's exactly the wrong person to say it. Like he does seem to have like this weird uh uh curse on his head. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, "Yes, you're right. Shut up." <laughs> you know? Well, You and I talked about this earlier in the week on my radio show, and this is the second time in his in recent months where Jason Kenney has basically stood up and and, in carefully controlled circumstances to basically call out the fringe right bullshit in Alberta and it was even the the fringe right bullshit of his own party. And I don't know. And I I just makes me wonder, right, because all of these things have been done either while defending his leadership before the review or after it uh, with his recent comments about Daniel Smith. This to me from 2000 kilometers away, 
this reads like resume polishing for me. Like he wants to be able to say three years from now when he's being interviewed on whatever, Hey, I was, I was just always struggling against these elements of my party and you can look back and you can see my public comments about it. Is, is it unfair of me to say that Jason Kenny has played footsie with these guys when it suited him? Oh yeah. I mean, I, in fact, I would even say bluntly the equalization referendum was a classic example of, yeah. it, of this. He, the, 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 the sovereignty act is just an, uh, just an obvious next logical step to the equalization referendum. That's it. You know, like, like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's totally hypocritical. But anyway, that's like a little blurb. I don't want to overdo the the sovereignty act stuff because I know we've been going on it so strong. But like the the nuts comment was was an interesting one. I just think I want a little write a little graph on it just to update our readers on it. But um, and then I think we're gonna have another piece coming from our other friends. Yeah, we as always we'll we'll put out the word to friends and family. Um, so when you said we have something coming in on the, um, hey, you know what? Let's just talk after. Let's we'll talk, talk after. about the, the, the media yeah. thing. Yeah. You got to go pick up your kids from camp. I do. I do. Okay. Well, that's all okay. I got. Yeah. I, can, I mean, Lisa Flam kind of ate the news cycle this week, but I think we got she some, did. some, but it's, some stuff. It's, there's, it's interesting. It's an interesting cycle. I know I'm going to get in trouble for what I, for what I said, but all I can say is let's, let's hold off and see what I write because oftentimes I'm right. I'm right. I'm speaking off the cuff and I'm writing a little bit more carefully. So there we go. I mean, I don't think there's anyone out there who doesn't think Lisa Flom knew exactly, uh, Lisa Laflam knew exactly what she was doing to publish that video when she did. Well, of course she did. And like, she, and also I would point out, she's well within her rights. My God. I mean, oh, like, yeah, as I, like the queen like of the it. rage quit over here, like, I'm not, it's, I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just uh, demanding the right to point out that, that there's a lot of this is calculated. That's all. Well, I, I've, I've shot a few wounded prisoners myself in my time um, when this, this is, this is an ego driven business. Like you can't do yep. this job without a pretty healthy, unhealthy, maybe ego. So yeah, look, to be honest, um, Laflamme tor torpedoing Bell's media strategy, probably knowing, as we've said, that Bell would be helpless because no media company can handle media scrutiny. Mm -hmm. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, I got, no I got nothing else. Like Ontario made a big healthcare announcement today, but it's, it's, it's a whole lot of, aspirational stuff for years from now um i don't i don't have anything to say about the quebec language thing uh where apparently the use of french has declined even in quebec we can probably find someone to write about that i don't have anything to say about it i guess yeah. we just call it here yeah i think we call it here okay well okay thanks everybody bye